start off, uh, my name is Scott Nunez, and I'm the sector manager for financials. My name is Poria Darius, I'm the associate manager. And my name is Laura Tagax, and I'm an analyst. And today we will present home bank shares. With regards to economic data, on the left, we have a chart illustrating banking revenue with respect to interest rate fluctuations. Recent decreases in interest rates have been reflected for several years. Although this could hamper banking revenue, the industry has resiliently maintained steady increases in revenue. As the economy continues to progress, given the positive data on the top right, the Fed has continued talks about when to implement interest rate hikes. With that said, we fully expect for banking revenue to continue to increase at a modest rate of 7.4% annually. This is a result of widening bank spreads on loans, allowing for higher profitability. Now for the industry outlook. Retail banking is geared more towards the consumer. Some of the products offered are checkings and savings, credit cards, personal loans, CDs, mortgages, as well as other products. Commercial banking, which is geared more towards businesses and corporations, some of the products are offered are business loans, auto loans, mortgage lending, as well as other investment products. Now for some company information. Home Banksters is a bank holding company. They operate under their wholly owned subsidiary, Centennial Bank. Centennial Bank offers both retail banking as well as commercial banking. Home Banksters' three strategies for growth are acquisitions, organic growth, and organ um, and an over branching, which simply means opening new branches. Some catalysts for investing in home bank shares are they have a transparent business model, they are operated by honest and experienced management, they have favorable long term prospects, and they are also available at a very attractive price. During 2014, home bank shares had total revenues of $309 million. 88% came from non interest income, while the remaining 12% came from interest income. Some key highlights for home bank shares are they have continuous growth, which can be seen in their earnings per share and their operating income on the left. They have been stable through downturns, and they, are, and they also have very cheap customer acquisitions. Now I will turn it over to Poria for company drivers. Thank you, Laura. So home bank shares has branch locations uh, across several regions in Florida, Arkansas, and Alabama. They have also recently started commercial lending operations out of New York. Moving on to the SWOT analysis, I'd like to break down some pros and cons of the firm. Uh, we'll elaborate more on detail as we go along. Uh, some strengths of the firm are their strong balance sheet, outstanding credit quality, and the fact that they're operated by experienced and honest bankers and executives. Uh, some weaknesses that stood out to us are uh, its brand recognition outside of its areas of operation, as well as its lower lending limits in comparison with its competitors. Some opportunities that are presented with home bank shares are its FDIC-assisted acquisitions, as well as the fact that it, its growth is non-cyclical with the economy. Some threats faced by the firm are, of course, the competitiveness of the financial industry, interest rate instability, as well as uh, government regulations. So here I want to talk about the risk and, mitigate, and the risk mitigation. Uh, of course, um, this ties into the threats faced by the firm. In regards to economic volatility, uh, we've seen that over the past few years, the S&P 500 performance as well as uh, the economic strength has continued to improve. We expect this growth, this positive growth to uh, come in the years to come. Uh, in regards to government regulations, home bank shares swiftly and strategically adapts to new regulations that they're faced with. Uh, for example, they maintain a sufficient amount of liquidity uh, in order to have uh, enough funds for reserve requirements. They do this primarily by using dividends paid by their wholly owned subsidiary, Centennial Bank, um, as the primary source of liquidity and um, while maintaining their well-capitalized structure. And in regards to interest rate risk, uh, home bank shares generally does not retain long-term fixed rate residential real estate loans due to collateral and interest rate risk. Um, in regards to competition, uh, home bank shares has a strong reputation within its communities as, as, as well as consistent business practices. Here I'd like to talk about the three main growth strategies of home bank shares, uh, acquisitions, organic loan growth, and de novo branching. Acquisitions happens to be the largest contributor of growth as well as the quickest, providing various new business opportunities as well as providing high returns and gains on assets. Um, as I've mentioned before, home bank shares, some of their acquisitions come FDIC assisted, which means that uh, some of the liability is picked up by the FDIC through law share agreements with the firm. Um, not many banks have this advantage to be able to acquire other banks. 
in order to be eligible for this, a bank needs to be well capitalized, which is a top tier on a five tier scale of capitalization. Uh, well capitalized basically means that they have a ratio of capital to risk weighted assets of at least 10% and a tier one leverage ratio of at least 5%. Organic loan growth is conducted by experienced bankers who target large and familiar markets in order to maximize potential. Uh, when assessing who to lend to, they only deal with credible and qualified borrowers to maintain their outstanding credit quality. And both these strategies present new opportunities with, for de novo branching, which is basically a home bank shares strategy for opening new branches in strategically placed locations. I'd like to elaborate on what I mean when I say home bank shares is non-cyclical with the economy, basically in times of economic, uh, economic sorry. Economic downturn, uh, home bank shares is presented with various opportunities for acquisition through the acquisition of failed banks. And in times of positive economic growth, home bank shares is or gains significant value from organic loan growth and de novo branching. One of the most important contributors to this firm's value are its management. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that this firm is run by a group of very experienced and invested members. As you can see from the table, most of the executives and board members have been with the firm since its opening in 1998. The rest of the individuals have been with the firm since uh, before it went public in 2006. Um, I'd like to also mention that John Allison, the chairman of the board, was actually the founder of the firm. And that although he stepped down as CEO, he's still heavily invested in the company as well as he's the, heart, he's the highest shareholder. Now I'd like to pass it to Scott with the company and financial analysis. If we look at the chart in the upper left-hand corner, we will see our uh, probability of defaulting within the next year. We have a low probability of defaulting at 0.0118%, and this categorizes us as investment grade four. This is on a scale of one to 10, one being the lowest chance of default and 10 being the highest chance of default while still being considered investment grade. If we look at the chart just below, we'll see our recent acquisitions. Home bank share is very decisive in the banks that it acquires. As we see in 2011, home bank shares de uh, decided not to acquire any banks and instead focus on increasing its net interest margins, which they were able to do. Also, as Poria alluded to earlier, FDIC-assisted acquisitions are very lucrative. When we enter into an FDIC-assisted acquisition, we enter into a loss sharing agreement. And what that means is when a bank loses a certain amount of money, uh, the FDIC is liable for that amount. Also, Home Bank Shares is currently uh, getting three deals done, and we expect at least two of those deals to finish uh, in 2015. And for our growth outlook, we could see that we've had increasing net income margins, interest income, and earnings per share, and we expect this to continue into the future. And this is because of our four operating goals. One is to have outstanding credit quality. We only borrow money to credited borrowers. Also, we uh, are always trying to improve profitability. We do this by focusing on net interest margin as well as decreasing our efficiency ratio, uh, increasing our income fees, and increasing our economies of scale. Also, we hire experienced bankers, and what that means is that we look to hire bankers who have a close-knit relationship with the community, so we truly are a community-focused bank. And lastly, we, have a main, uh, we like to maintain a fortress balance sheet, and we do this four ways, by having high asset quality, uh, being well-capitalized, Focus on high performance metrics such as return on tangible equity and return on assets. And lastly, by uh, having high liquidity, which allows us to take advantage of acquisitions as they become available. And for our fundamental analysis, we see that over the past five years, we've had increasing net interest margins, a decreasing efficiency ratio, which is measured by expenses divided by revenue, so decreasing is positive. And I'd also like to point out that we've had a tier one ratio of 12.55%, which is over double the amount, uh, the, over double the minimum set by the U.S. government. And we have an interest rate sensitivity of 85%. And what that means is over the past five years, our interest rate, our, our interest rates, our assets have become less sensitive to interest rates. And for evaluation analysis, I'll first start with comparables. Home bank shares stacks up very favorably against both its narrow and broad competitors. In fact, we beat our narrow and broad competitors in every single category, except for total debt to total assets by narrow margins. Uh, one thing that stands out uh, to all of us is our revenue, or is our revenue three-year growth, which is at 22.61%, and this is mostly attributed to our ability to acquire banks. 
After looking at our, t our competitors' 10Ks, we see that most of them do not acquire banks anymore or have lost their ability to enter into FDIC-assisted acquisitions. We know that our management is the best at assessing the banks for sale and determining which ones will create the highest profitability. And for our valuation, we use uh, market value to average share comps, price to cash flow, price to tangible book value, as well as a dividend discount model and analyst recommendations. Our dividend discount model was a hybrid model that also used CAPM, and our dividend discount model had three assumptions. One, it had a growth rate of 10.77%, a cost equity of 11.64%, and that home bank shares would pay out a dividend of 40 cents per share. Based off our valuation, we give home bank shares a buy, and it's currently trading at $33.95, and this gives us, a, and we have a target price of $44.04, which gives us a target upside percent of 22.9%. To conclude our presentation, I would like to reiterate that we are giving home bank shares a target price of $44.04. And what this means is that we have a target upside of 22.9% from our current price of $33.95. And we are able to attain this target price based off our four catalysts. One, we have a transparent business model. We know that our growth will be coming from acquisitions, organic loan growth, as well as Novo branching. We have favorable long-term prospects in each of these uh, growth segments. Because of the recent... Um, regulation that's come from the federal government, we pretty much have an economic moat around the acquisition growth strategies among <laughs> banks. And we are operated by honest and experienced management. We are able to fight through the dot-com bubble as well as the financial crisis. We are very well capitalized and we have a very high tier one ratio. And lastly, we are available at a very attractive price. Not only do we see that quantitatively through our uh, metrics and valuation, but the fact that we have a $2.3 billion market cap and we, have abs and we have no analyst reports on Bloomberg, we are a hidden gem that company, or that's hard for investors to find. Uh, and we believe that home bank shares will, is a buy for our portfolio and we'll add alpha to our returns. Thank you, and I'd like to open up the floor to Q&A. My concern was you're saying, I agree there's a lot of uh, experience there, but I'm a little concerned with some of the ages. Who's, who's being groomed to like take over when some of the older people leave out? Is there like a plan? Because you have 68. I mean, he's into retirement. He's, you said he's stepping down. Has there been any negative effects from his stepping down? or? Uh, not really. It's mostly strategic. Cause I think what he was trying to do is uh, groom uh, Randy is what they call Randall. Uh, so that's how I'll reference him. So they're trying to groom Randy to step into his position, which he'll probably be in for many years. Again, he was also one of the people who've been with the companies for a long time, and he understands what it takes to get the company through hardships and to grow it. And since I think the fact that we have John Allison, who is the founder, and again, many of these people who've been with the company for a long time, I think it more of a pro because they have a vested interest. John Allison has the largest stake in it. So I don't see him leaving anytime soon unless he was going to liquidate most of his shares and maybe move to I've, Naples because apparently I've it's really nice. 67. Also like. <laughs> but you use Lynette Pharmaceutical Products. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the company based? Uh, it has a state charter in Arkansas, but it also is a part of the Federal Reserve System, so it has to uh, uh, accommodate to both uh, regulations. Yeah, they opened up a commercial lending operations in New York about, uh, I think, a month ago. But they have loans in other states. So one of the things is, like, with energy, they're speculating that maybe they would acquire banks in Texas or maybe give out more loans in Texas. But actually, John Allison, the founder, said that they probably aren't, that they're actually going to be cutting down on the loans they give out to people in Texas because of how risky it is, and that's not a market that they want to be in. Why, why do they have actually... Uh, Georgia is actually a great opportunity, and they're open to expanding into different locations. It's more about uh, like the price and the value of the bank. So, for instance, in Georgia, that, ha that was the state with the most failed banks from 2002 to 2013. So if I had to assume, I would say that there's a lot of purchasing of banks and a lot of uh, overvaluation of the banks that, uh, that were in that area. I'd also like to add that their branch locations don't only – they're not only reserved to their – uh, specific states. They also extend outside of their areas of operation. I had to move in any other areas of banking, like currency trading, investment banking, you know, things like that, or just maintain their asset lending. And so, I don't know what the fee composition is or what's. Yeah. So um, for one of their four operating goals, one of them is to increase their uh, their fee income. 
And if I had to assume, that would probably be because of just for diversification reasons, since they have 88% coming from interest income and only 12% coming from non-interest income. I've got a question. On the type of clientele that they service, uh, it looks like in Arkansas, they probably have agriculture type lenders, I mean borrowers. In Orlando, what type of, of customers do they have? Is it the hospitality industry? Uh, I'm not do sure. Do you know? I don't know like what it is for each specific reason, region, but I know that 25% of our portfolio is uh, residential real estate, 49% is commercial real estate. And Brandon, do you know the other uh, percentages? Right now, no. So, so most of it uh, is, uh, I guess, a real estate-based uh, loan. CRE, right. I, I also noticed that in the consumer segment and the business segment, they have auto loans under the business segment. Is that because they lend to uh, floor plans at, at the beginning of the yeah. presentation? Uh, that was just like an industry outlook. So that's not our company specifically. That's just the banking industry. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, I got it. Uh, you know, I know this company. They bought a friend of mine's bank. The Rao Bank? Uh, bank oh, yes. But, you know, it, when they're getting their growth from acquisitions, the question would be, is the pipeline still there for acquisitions? You mentioned something about an acquisition mode. Yeah. That term. So, to be able to uh, purchase banks and acquire banks, as Porter alluded to, you have to have a total uh, asset to total risk based of 10%. An asset to uh, risk weighted, or a capital to risk weighted asset ratio of at least 10% and a tier one leverage ratio of at least 5%. So many banks don't qualify for this. So because of that reason, they actually aren't allowed to acquire banks. So leads banks like ours that actually have the abilities to acquire banks that they see uh, fit. Yeah, uh, so regulation has actually stiffened uh, since the financial crisis. That's the one, two, and three, right? Mm -hmm. The banker can tell us that, huh? More capital, right? Well, I, I think one of the issues is going to be going forward, there's very little banks that can be acquired, especially under FDIC, because, you know, basically most banks are uh, are uh, in a better, you know, economic shape. I know our bank is looking and looking, and we've been looking for the last three years, and we do have those ratios, maybe three times those ratios, but we can't find any targets. Yeah, so very to, difficult to build off of that. So uh, as we see, uh, so we actually kind of went a little bit away towards acquiring FDIC uh, banks because of how, as we can see, so the light blue is FDIC assisted acquisitions, while the darker blue is just normal bank acquisitions. So there actually haven't been that many out there. And I think last year there's only about eight FDIC assisted acquisitions, and the number has been going down since 2008. So one of the things that we have been focusing more on is our organic growth loan operations and um, also de novo branching. So that's something that's kind of new to us. I think we are, we've opened up one de novo branch last year, and we're looking to open up one more this year in the Panhandle area is something, is an area where they see a lot of uh, growth opportunity. So I think because there's not a lot of opportunities to acquire banks, the Novo branching is where they're kind of going into for market penetration now. Um, I cheated a little bit with my uh, question. One of the analysts that works for me is one of the analysts covering uh, this bank, and so I, I, tech, I uh, asked him for a question to ask. <laughs> you, you, you actually covered it to some extent in your presentation. Um, talk about how well the bank is doing in managing expenses, and especially in an environment of flat uh, interest rates. Yeah. So. Um with their efficiency ratio, they have a target efficiency ratio of 41%, and I think last year it was at 43.93%, and for the earnings call, they're already down to, I think it was like 40, like high 41, almost 42%. So they're able to manage their efficiency really well, and one of the ways they do that is when they acquire banks, uh, their management is able to decide what branches are good and that they should keep and which branches that maybe they should uh, cut, off, cut out. And they're also uh, moving, they're not focusing on this, but I would say that with the uh, advent of like the internet and internet banking and, Google and Apple Pay, that they're able to cut costs with less physical uh, banks. Again, not that they've closed any banks down now that are their own, but Apple Pay is a new uh, revenue source with, which has low, um, low cost. And they actually teamed up with Apple, even though it's a small community bank, they teamed up with Apple Pay. So that's something to note. You didn't tell me what the answer was, so I'll have to take your word for it. <laughs> I've got a question. What percentage of the bank is closely held by the uh, by by the you know the by the, the inside group? What percentage of the entire bank? 
Because I know the bank is public, but you know what percentage do they have? Is it over 50%, under 50? Do you have that data? I don't know if you do. No, I don't think we do. Um, I know that uh, I want to say that like the founders and the management have a substantial portion, uh, I believe, like a 25 to 50% portion of it. So I know they actually do hold a substantial portion of the bank. Of the bank so shares. at the end of the day, if they want to sell, whatever they want to do is what happens. You mean sell the bank or both. sell their own shares? Well, it's both. If you, if you sell control, you're selling shares. Yeah, theoretically. Yeah. What, one quick question. You mentioned that the interest rate sensitivity has gone down, yeah. and I assume you mean the negative interest rate sensitivity. Did you do any modeling uh, about what happens to spreads and to the margins if interest rates do move higher over the next five years? So uh, we expect interest, if interest rates do go higher that we will have a higher spread. Uh, uh, from what we've uh, gathered is that when interest rates go up in the short term, our uh, interest rate sensitivity would go up because uh, like three-year bonds are get uh, three three-month bonds get affected uh, sooner than like a 10-year bond. So we so we expect like in the short term that it might be uh, have a negative influence, but in the long run, I think interest rates will increase our spread and therefore increase our profitability. In regards to interest rate sensitivity, looking at the competitors, especially the narrow ones, none of them were nearly as transparent as home bank shares with their interest rate sensitivity or um, as to necessarily why the, uh, some of them terminated their law share agreements with the FDIC. So obviously those raised some red flags within those firms. With those competitors, not ours. Our not ours. Those our are, company was transparent. Those are with the competitors, as I mentioned. Okay, one last question. Is this... Um cheap or this they're going to be surprising somehow positively yeah the stock yeah we have the stock undervalued Is that we have a 22.9 percent upside and we believe that uh 33 dollars and 95 cents it's very attractive yeah for, we had a valuation slide with some competitors and it's kind of in the middle of those if i recall does it does it look cheap against itself Comparing its own stock and PE and price to cash flow, or and historically, uh, I mean, I, it's kind of hard to tell because they have had such rapid growth. Like, you know, like how do you price in rapid growth and then decide whether or not it's, uh, I guess, historically cheap or expensive? By looking at ratios, I would say, rather than at price, because price is not an indicator there, but. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't. You haven't, you haven't checked. It. Okay. So what I'm saying is, for example, if they had, uh, if they had a PE last year of 25 and now it's 18, um, you would say, well, now it looks cheaper than it was last year, based on that one. If, or if you have another ratio or five different ratios and you compare them against itself, that's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, I don't know the. Uh the ratios are uh, valued against the competitors. We used uh, a pricing model that basically uh, used forward rate forward rates uh, in re in respect to competitors and using our price and then uh, gaining a target price from that. So th uh, I just wanted to clarify that those aren't just the ratios. Tangible, the, the tangible book value, as high as it is, can actually be a positive thing if they're in growth mode and execute. So when you were looking at other companies, So their main competitor is the Bank of the Ozark, which is another uh, bank of Arkansas. So whenever you actually read any articles about one, the other one's always mentioned. And Bank of the Ozarks uh, actually hasn't acquired any banks since 2013. They have a higher price and a higher market cap, and I believe that they have a, a lower upside with their ability to grow organically and from uh, and from you know acquisitions. Uh, the Bank of the Ozarks um, had, I think, like the highest P ratio. They had really high ratios at price to ca price to free cash flow of 67 compared to ours, which is at eight. Uh, and since that's its like main competitor. Comparing the two, I think we blow it out of the water. Mm. 
Yeah. No. Uh, so we have a slide, and so they actually acquired two banks in South Florida: the, the Broward Bank, as long as along with the Doral Bank. And would you like to talk more? Uh, yeah, I was just going to mention the Doral Bank. Yeah, and so they also have operations in Central Florida, and they're increasing their operations in the Panhandle. They see that as a good opportunity there. So what, 50% of the bank is also small on I'm not sure where, about the asset composition on a ge geographical basis. The number of that branch. Yeah. All those in favor of, of basically voting the stock in the portfolio, raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think we're we're good. Thank you. Thank you.